This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the February 19th, 2018 edition of the Weekly Top 3, our weekly 15-minute-ish podcast covering the top three things on our mind as we make the turn from the past week to the one ahead. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you can follow and participate in the discussion with us of news and our commentary on these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on our Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. You also can find this in past episodes of the Weekly Top 3 on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages and on my website at bgkeithley.com. This week, our top three issues are these. First, the growing effort to avoid using the term PFD cuts by those who are seeking to make them. Second, a question of whether we are heading toward cuts in pers ters retirement benefits. And third, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission's response this past week to AGDC's submissions in support of the AKLNG project. Let's start by talking about the growing effort by some to avoid using the term PFD cuts when, in fact, that's exactly what they're proposing to do. What triggers our discussion this week, as it sometimes does other weeks, is a column by Charles Wolferth, this time uh, over the weekend in the Anchorage Daily News. The title of the column is, Here's the True Economic Cost of the Uncertainty Created by the Alaska Legislature. In the column, Wolferth uh, goes through a recent, starts by going through a recent ICER study uh, that frankly we talked about last week uh, that analyzes the effect on the private sector of, of not having fiscal certainty uh, in the government sector, not knowing what the government is going to do in terms of raising new revenues uh, or lowering government spending. Uh, and as a result over in the private sector, deferring investment, uh, deferring taking business steps uh, until the government uh, reveals its hand about how what its steps it's going to take to affect the private sector. Wolfer's discussion of that in the first segment of the of the piece is frankly a fairly good summary of the uh, of the analysis that ICER has done. But then in the second piece, he starts turning to what the solution to that be should be, how we should be providing the certainty that ICER finds is lacking and is having an effect on the private sector. And this, this is the discussion of that. Governor Bill Walker pointed out late in 2015 that only Alaska permanent fund earnings could cover most of the deficit. The math made it inevitable. No other potential source of revenue was large enough to do the job, according to Wolford. In 2016, the Senate passed a bill that would have used fund earnings to bridge much of the budget gap, but the House Finance Committee, then controlled by Republicans, turned it down. In 2017, both the House and Senate passed bills to use the fund, but disagreement on taxes to cover the rest of the gap uh, blocked a deal. So, and then he goes on to articulate that that is a necessary part of the solution and then starts talking toward the end of the column about taxes being also part of the solution. Here's the deal. Those proposals that he talks about, the governor's proposal in 2015, the Senate bill passed in 2016, and the House and Senate bills passed in 2017, all rely heavily on cuts to the PFD in order to provide the revenues necessary, uh, Wolforth believes necessary, uh, to fund government. But nowhere in the column does Wolferth, does Wolferth use the term PFD cut. In fact, you can't really you can't find the term permanent fund dividend uh, in the entire column. The same thing's true of statements made by Senate President Pete Kelly uh, early last week in the Senate uh, majority's uh, press availability uh, when he talked about uh, where. Uh, he felt uh, the legislature was in terms of achieving a balanced budget. Here's what Kelly said. With oil prices and production, we're within grasp of a balanced budget. That does not mean we don't have to have a fiscal plan. We're going to move forward with a fiscal plan, but I think the talk of taxing Alaskans, we would hope they would put that in the garbage can over on the House side. The point is that is not part of the Senate's plan going forward. We do need to have a structured draw from the earnings reserve, said Kelly, and that's going to be one of the Senate's priorities 
making sure there are structured rules for getting into the ERA. Once again, nothing, no mention of PFD cuts, but the term structured draw from earnings from the earnings reserve, close quote, when you look back at what the Senate does, means exactly that. It means a PFD cut. It means reducing the amount available for the PFD from 50% of the draw uh, down to 25% of the draw. So why are these people talking about PFD cuts without fessing up, manning up, and saying that's exactly what they're talking about without using the term PFD cuts? Well, we think part of the reason is because they know, both in Wolfer's case and in Kelly's case, they know that a PFD cut is worse for the economy than the, than the very thing they're concerned about. In Wolfer's case, he's concerned about the, the effect on the private sector, on the Alaska economy, of not having uh, fiscal certainty and, and refers to the ISA report that talks about that cost being somewhere in the neighbor of, neighborhood of 500 uh, to $600 million. Well, a PFD cut has a, a larger adverse effect on the economy. Uh, you take 750 million of the, of the of the proposals that he referenced. You take 750 million dollars out of the economy. By the time you apply the uh, the 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 multiplier effect to that, it's about a billion dollars out of the economy. Far worse than the effect of of the uncertainty that he's talking about. In Kelly's case, he's talking about taxes. Uh, and how they're trying to avoid taxes. Well, ICER has found that PFD cuts have a larger, in fact, the largest adverse impact on the overall economy than taxes. And they are, and PFD cuts are by far the costliest alternative to Alaska families, costlier to Alaska families than income taxes. So by not using the term, both Wolferth and Kelly are trying to avoid confronting the fact that PFD cuts, the thing they are advocating, is worse for the Alaska economy than the thing they're complaining about. The thing that bothers me, frankly, is the press is letting them get away with that. The press is letting them use terminology in the articles and, and, in, the, and, and in Wolfer's column, letting them uh, get away without using the term PFD cuts and then not analyzing and not comparing the effect of the PFD cuts uh, against the very thing uh, that they're advocating. We need, to, we need to fess up in this state. If we're talking about PFD cuts, if, if columnists, if politicians are talking about PFD cuts, they need to admit that's what they're talking about. And then they need to be prepared to defend why making a PFD cut is better in their view than the alternative that they're, that they're trying to defend against. This, 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 this approach of not talking about it so it doesn't exist, not talking about PFD cuts so the effect of it somehow doesn't exist, just doesn't work. We need transparency, truth, honesty, directness in this state as we talk about these issues, and we're not getting it, at least out of, out of these two instances. Second thing we're following this week is the issue of PERS and TERS, retirement benefits under the, the two state uh, retirement plans and the effect they are having uh, long-term on the budget. Senate Finance held a hearing uh, on the issue last week, Wednesday of last week. Uh, there's, a, there's a piece on it in, uh, in today's, Monday's um, uh, Alaska Public Media. Uh, the headline is more than $6 billion gap in state pension funding draws concern. The pensions, uh, the way the state has dealt with the pensions over the last few years is sort of run in place with uh, some annual funding toward building up an endowment uh, to deal with the pensions over the long term uh, for various reasons underfunding those and then trying to catch up with one big contribution uh, that hopefully puts the state back in a better position uh, and avoids the need to uh, address them again uh, in, in subsequent times. The state did that in 2013 uh, with uh, trying to, trying to uh, offset uh, an underfunding that occur, had occurred for various reasons up to that point. 
by putting $3 billion, taking $3 billion out of the Constitutional Budget Reserve and putting it over uh, into the PERS and TERS fund. It seems to have worked for a while, but now we're running right back up into the same issue. The hearing on Wednesday was about uh, how big the unfunded obligation is, again, how big the the hole that has been created um, uh, in PERS and TERS and what to do about it. Uh, the testimony was that we now are facing something like a $6 billion uh, underfunded liability. That is the difference between the amount that's currently in the PERS and TERS uh, uh, funds and the amount that should be there to take care of the liability that uh, has accrued uh, and is owed, uh, projected to be owed going forward uh, as uh, employees retire. The approach that legislature, the government, has been taking with respect to these obligations has been essentially to kick the can down the road. They've adopted a funding mechanism that uh, uh, ramps up over time with smaller payments uh, earlier and larger payments uh, later uh, and, and creates uh, budget issues uh, down the road. Uh, for example, in the governor's latest 10-year forecast, uh, he shows, the governor shows uh, uh, funding for retirement at about 245 to $270 million uh, in the current fiscal year, uh, but with an obligation ramping up to $430 million by 2028. And that's in the 10-year forecast. If you took that forecast on out, it would continue to ramp up uh, uh, over a, a period extending into the 2030s uh, before it started coming down, uh, coming down again on the other side. So we're talking about you know, between 2019 and 2028, we're talking about an increase of somewhere in the neighborhood of $175 million in annual spending devoted just to PERS and TERS. And if, as we as we are discovering, as we discovered in the hearing on Wednesday, if we have a significant underfunded liability, those numbers just go up. You have to you have to cover the 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 ultimate liability in some fashion if you don't make big big deposits. Uh, as we did in 2013, then you have to build up the annual payments. So the slope between 2019, if that in fact is the under, underfunding amount, the slope between uh, 2019 and 2028 may be even more steep uh, than $175 million. We're just, we're, we're essentially trading, um, the legislature has taken us down a path of essentially trading uh, low uh, initial payments to make spending levels look low in in current years, uh, but at the expense of significantly higher spending levels uh, in subsequent years, uh, and now maybe even higher than than projected because of uh, the unfunded liability. The hearing was interesting uh, in two respects. One was uh, uh, the reaction of Senator McKinnon, who led the effort in 2013 to deposit the three billion dollars take the $3 billion out of the Constitutional Budget Reserve and deposit it over into PERS. Senator McKinnon was quoted as saying something like, uh, well, $6 billion is a big number. We need to do something about that. Uh, and, and essentially saying we need, to, we need to make another big deposit toward the unfunded liability um, uh, while, we, while we still have reserves, uh, which and since the only reserves now are in the earnings reserve, she's talking about uh, talking about moving dollars. Must be talking about moving dollars out of the earnings reserve uh, over into the into PERS and TERS to try to catch up again, do a do a replay uh, of 2013. Senator von Inhofe, on the other hand, I think uh, looking further down the road, uh, had a different take on the message from the hearing, uh, and was and and was. Quoted in APRN, in the APRN article, is essentially saying this. Anchorage Republican Senator Natasha Von Imhoff said it may be necessary to reduce retiree benefits in the future. To simply say, make the payments, that crowds out public safety, education, among other things, 
as we're seeing in our budget challenges that we have now. Uh, and instead, it may be more appropriate to reduce retiree benefits, reduce spending on retiree benefits uh, going forward to make room uh, for those other things. We would suspect that that will be sufficient to get the State Retirees Association motivated on this issue. It should be enough to get the State Retirees Association motivated on the issue. But from our perspective, uh, the focus when they become motivated shouldn't necessarily be on, oh my gosh, we can't reduce benefits. They need to be focused on taking action on things that make it create the environment in which those bene- in which we don't need to have that discussion. We don't need to be talking about reducing benefits. And, and that action is to reduce spending in other areas to make room uh, in the budget going forward the next 10 years, the next 20 years, to make room in the budget to accommodate uh, the additional contributions that are going to be na- need to be made uh, to build up the retirement plan the retirement funds to, to deal with with retirement. Senator Von Enhoff is correct. Uh, spending on retirement, if if we don't do anything else, is going to crowd out spending on in other areas. Um, and there will be a competition at some point between whether we spend on those other areas uh, and whether or whether we spend on retirement. We've seen that sort of competition going on with the PFD, and the answer of many has been to cut the PFD in order to continue spending on these other things without doing without doing taxes. There's no difference, frankly, once you get out there into the future years and see the retirement spending uh, uh, rising as it's going to need to uh, in, in the discussion at that point about, well, do we spend on K through 12 or do we spend on retirement? And frankly, we see a lot of pressure uh, to reduce spending on retirement. We think uh, Senator Von Inhofe is just raising the issue that's that's uh, just raising the issue now that we're going to be seeing out there in the future. So we think it's it's important for the retirees to start to add to the pressure to reduce spending on other things. If you want continued contributions of the of the level necessary to fund uh, the retirement accounts out in the future, uh, spending on other things will need to be reduced and we should start it now. Uh, or else uh, we're not going to have it reduced uh, as as these additional increases in retirement contributions are required. The final issue we're following this week relates to a somewhat lengthy letter sent by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, or FERC, last week to the Alaska Gas Line Development Corporation, uh, the state entity responsible for the construction of the Alaska LNG project, um, uh, in, re- in the letter responds to the AGDC's um, application for approval from FERC uh, to build the pipeline. Uh, FERC is has jurisdiction over whether or not to permit exports of of LNG out of the country uh, to other countries, and in connection with that, uh, is reviewing the pipeline, the proposed facilities that would be. Uh, connected to that export project. Uh, AGDC, uh, FERC had initially asked a series of questions about related to the pipeline. AGDC had responded to that in December. Uh, The letter is in response to AGDC's response. And the letter, frankly, outlines a large number of deficiencies in AGDC's response that the FERC says uh, will preclude it from proceeding forward in connection with its analysis until those issues are resolved. Uh, a couple of those is- issues are, are significant. Uh, uh, well, all uh, there are a number of issues that are significant that are raised in the letter. It's a 200 page plus page letter, a lot of issues in there. Uh, two of them come immediately to mind uh, and they are related to uh, uh, whether or not, or event, an evaluation of whether the line should have been built or should be built uh, to Valdez or to uh, the Matsu uh, uh, port of Port McKenzie uh, instead of uh, to Nikiski, as AGDC uh, has proposed. There were interventions by Valdez, uh, the city of Valdez, and by uh, the Matsu 
uh, asking the FERC to force AGDC to evaluate those alternate points because uh, they believe those uh, ports would be better suited to this purpose than than Nikiski, the the port selected by the Alaska LNG project. To some degree, this is Alaska shooting itself in the foot yet again uh, with respect to uh, uh, a gas line project. Um, the evaluation of, of whether to build to Valdez or whether to build to Port McKenzie uh, will require a lot of additional work, a lot of additional study, um, and, and, and an analysis uh, sufficient to satisfy FERC. Uh, that that those alternatives have been evaluated and sufficient to provide FERC with the with the uh, material to to confirm that the that the appropriate uh, place to build to is Nikiski as opposed to one of those uh, alternatives. So you're asking for a fairly full study uh, of what those alternatives would require uh, instead of going to Nikiski. If those studies exist, that's great. I haven't seen any indication that they do in the depth required by FERC. Uh, and so the additional time and expense it's going to require to back up and look at Valdez and at Port McKenzie uh, is going to be a big, is going, to, is going to create a big gap uh, in the timeline that AGDC has been pursuing to try to put this uh, project together. It is not uh, un unimaginable that it would take a year and perhaps longer uh, to do those that additional work to meet uh, the issues related to Valdez and Port McKenzie uh, and and get it done in a way that satisfy that's satisfactory to FERC and then provides the record on which FERC uh, can make the decision. That delay of a year uh, could very well move the AKLNG project out of the timeline, out of a competitive timeline to compete for markets uh, that are opening uh, in China uh, and elsewhere, LNG markets that are opening in China and elsewhere that a AKLNG has been trying to has been trying to match up with uh, in an effort to sync this project to uh, to markets. So it could very well be another situation where. Uh, Alaska was getting closer to a project, and then uh, just at the time that uh, the project might be coming together, uh, either the state or one of the one of the localities shot the project uh, in the heart uh, and killed it. We saw that in 2016, 20, 2006 rather, uh, with the pro with the proposal to go to the lower 48, when Governor Palin and the legislature passed a GIA. Uh, essentially uh, 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 diverting uh, what then had been a fairly major effort by the majors to put together a project to build uh, to the lower 48, diverting that off on another track to the point where uh, Alaska lost the market. We could be say, seeing the same thing again. Big issue, uh, how the AGDC deals with it is going to be important, and if they don't have those studies, the time it's going to take to respond to it uh, is going to be uh, uh, potentially uh, a, uh, a a threat uh, to being able to bring the project together at all. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3. Thank you for joining us this week. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages and keep track of us during the week on our Facebook and Twitter pages. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.